three-leafed chili pepper seedlings? Turning glowworms into silkworms? Is this the work of a mad biologist? Hey, I'm not mad, I'm just angry, okay? Welcome to Peppers mm, Glowworms, a channel dedicated to hot chili peppers and coldly glowing glowworms. <coughs> 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 this is vidlog number 52, March 2022, part 1. Chili pepper breeding program update. Well, alrighty then, I guess it is about time for an update on my chili pepper breeding program. I have the goal to breed a small fruited super hot chili pepper variety and for that purpose I have mixed a few chili pepper varieties and this year I will continue and it looks kinda hopeful. I think I have two main breeding lines in the work right now. It is the Ahi Charipa and the Cariolokia Screeper Strain Zero. And I have overwintered a few plants, but I have also seeded out some new ones this year. I started late in January where I uh, took some chili pepper fruits that were kind of moldy and not good for eating or consuming. And so I thought, if I can't eat it, I'll seed it. So I opened those uh, nasty old moldy chili pepper pots and uh, soaked the seeds in chamomile tea, just to be uh, sure and just uh, kind of as a tradition, I guess. And I seeded them out. I took those seeds from the F2 generation of my Cariolokia Screeper Strain Zero breeding line and specifically from the specimens number 3 and 4 because uh, they have the most potential from the individuals I tested so far and I did a taste test last year on those two. Number 3 had almost small enough fruits which is why I will name it Red Dwarf from now on, while number 4 had excellent heat and taste. And since the pods look kinda like uh, the ancestral ghost pepper, I will dub this one ghost fire. But anyway, the seeds germinated quite quickly and I noticed something. First let's have a look at red dwarf. I see something here and here. Let's have a closer look at what do we have here. Ah, a plant with three cotyledons, at least it looks like it. And over there is the other one. Interesting. Now let's have a look at number four, the ghost fire. It's not as easy to see at first, but there's something going on as well here and here. And over there, let's have a closer look. Uh, this one is, looks like a split cotyledon, that's almost like three. There's three leaves and there's also three leaves. Ah, uh, you know what? I have an idea. I have noticed this trait of multiple cotyledons or split cotyledons or whatever that actually might be. I have noticed this uh, quite often in my Cariolokia breeding lines, but now it's uh, occurring quite uh, uh, abundantly. I don't think it has anything to do with uh, mutagenic toxins from the uh, mold of the fruit in the beginning, but uh, there's always hope that something interesting might have happened there, but I guess not uh, in regards to those uh, cotyledon thing. But anyway, I like the freaks and so uh, now I have decided to select those and just uh, pick out the uh, quote unquote normal ones um, and leave only the three leafed freaks in there and see what happens. Because, after all, uh, breeding chili peppers the way I do it is, is its not an art, it's not a science either. It is simply a matter of luck. So, uh, uh, wish, wish me luck. And here they are about a month later. Those are the offspring of Ghost Fire and those two are the offspring of Red Dwarf. You can see uh, those of number four of ghost fire they need to be repotted and separated very soon those of uh, red dwarf number three um they have grown uh, 
a little bit or even nothing at all if I look at this particular individual here. Um, I don't think it's because of the soil, because the soil of the, those two pots is the same. I reused some substrate from my glowworm colonies and topped it off with some uh, cocoa fiber for germination purposes. But uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be a bad sign that they are growing so slowly, because uh, Carioca back then was also a slow grower and many of the very super hots are also uh, more on the slow side of growth, so uh, might actually be a good sign. Who knows? Yeah. By the way, those seedlings that I picked off are mostly still alive, but they are isopod food now. Those are some of the Ahi Charipa F2 plants that I overwintered, and you can see that they are developing some flowers already. Some a bit, a bit further ahead. Others have only teeny tiny flower buds. But of course, who else but Winterberry would be the first to have an actually opened flower and it had already there was some pollen already, so maybe we are up to an early start with those. And I also have five more individuals in another place. And those five uh, have been heavily pruned and repotted, so they are in another stage of development and not as far ahead as those. But we shall see who wins the race. The Cariolokia Screepa Strain 0 F2 individuals that I overwintered, namely a ghost fire and red dwarf, um, they have also been heavily pruned, but for a good reason. They um, had a big, or still have maybe, I am afraid so, uh, a big problem with sap suckers like thrips and aphids, and they uh, dined on them quite. Uh, quite uh, heavily, uh, but I think um, it's getting better now and uh, despite all this um, Wet Dwarf was the first one to develop an opened flower, uh, even back in January already without any artificial lighting, but uh, of course this did not lead anywhere because of all those aphids and maybe the sun wasn't uh, good enough already. But yeah, that's the state of my breeding program for now and I'm not exactly sure what different specimens will be crossed next, but it will be among those, the offspring of Red Dwarf or Ghostfire or their parents as back crosses or maybe a cross pollination with the Ahi Charipa, uh, uh, many possibilities and I will see in which direction I will go. Moving on. Part 2. What's going on with my Sardinian glowworms? Let's have a look into all the boxes I keep my Sardinian glowworms in. First off, a large group of larvae, well, mostly larvae of the generation 23. They are currently feasting on ram's horn snails. This one is enjoying it quite a bit sitting inside the shell and munching on the ram's horn snail, like this one as well. And the other ones are already eaten out. Ah, and there we have some pupae. Male pupae, recognizable by the well-developed wings and the large eyes. Nice, nice, nice. And they have eaten well, empty shells everywhere. And some of them seem to be hungry still. Let's take a look under this sea almond leaf. Oh, even more pupae. Huh? I think I will 
have to collect some. First, let's take this three, one, two, three male pupae of the generation 23. And now under the sea almond leaf, let's move it aside. And collect some more pupae. There are also many larvae in this slightly curved position and I think they will pupate soon as well. Or I'm very sure they will. Okay then. Let's put this thing back and leave them alone for now. And this is where they will go, those pupae. In this box I have, as you can see, already quite a few pupae and they are all generation 23 and now they will get some company. Let's space them out a bit so they have enough room for themselves. What a nice sight. And of course there are also already some adult males that have already emerged from the pupae. And this is very nice. Some eggs. And those eggs were um, laid by females of generation 22 because um, I have just more of them from this generation. But I cannot see any females right here now in the open, but anyway let's have a look at those eggs first. Right at the edge of the box. Not very good to see, but they are there. Right there. Ah, well. Let's Take the camera off the tripod and have a closer look. Ah. Now we're talking. Yeah, that's the rise of generation 24. Nice. <laughs> the future of my Sardinian glowworms. Next generation. Yep. And this is uh, the rest of generation 22 that I already mentioned. There are a few larvae left and quite a few oh, pupae and newly hatched females, adult females. There we go. This is the empty pupa of this individual and this one is uh, from that adult female. Yeah. And there's also another one. And this is currently just a uh, hatching from the pupa. A nice big adult female, likely to contain many eggs.
And this one I saw glowing just uh, yesterday night, the last night. So I will collect this one now. It is uh, ready to mate. And you can guess where this one will go. But first let's uh, tidy this up a bit and remove those empty pupae. And put this back and leave them alone too. And there you go. Now it is in the box of the F23 males. And let's leave it there, in hopes of some additional X containing the generation 24. Last but not least, the backup box. Here we have a bunch of late bloomers of generation 22 that were not fortunate enough to have partners of generation 23 to mate with, like those two males here. And those eggs were laid by females of generation 22 that only mated with males of the same generation, so those eggs are generation 23. Oh, and let's remove those pupil skin while we're at it, tidy up the whole thing a bit. And you can see also some larvae crawling around. Those are not only newly hatched, generation 23 larvae, like uh, this tiny one, for example, but uh, also bigger ones, slightly bigger. And those are generation 23 larvae that were uh, a bit behind. So the backup box is basically the home for late bloomers. Part 3. Tree of Heaven Silk Moth Colony. In late September of 2021, I got some Tree of Heaven Silk Moth eggs. And I got them in exchange for some glowworm larvae, hence the clickbaity title and intro sequence. But anyway, let's move quickly to the life cycle of this first generation that I got. The eggs hatched, the L1 larvae resulted and they were growing and shedding their skin to the L2 larvae and then the L3 larvae and those kept growing and growing. And then the L3 larvae turned into the L4 larvae, and the L4 larvae turned into the L5 larvae, which is the final stage. Um, here you can see an empty skin of the L4 larva. And of course these L5 larvae, they grow massively. They are really, really eating machines. I mean, they are all eating machines, but especially L5. Uh, they are hard to satisfy. I fed them a tree of heaven, which grows abundantly almost as a weed uh, in Berlin. And the L5 larvae kept growing and growing. And in late October, the first larva started to spin a cocoon. And then others started making their little cocoons and I ended up with a little more than 60 cocoons and uh, one larva chose to uh, not make a cocoon and it pupated just without a cocoon, which was uh, somewhat nice so I could see the pupa without having to open any cocoons. And here you can see the setup I used for having the cocoons hatch. And the adults did hatch and lay eggs and completed the life cycle. And with those uh, more numerous larvae I was a bit more prone to experiment and I fed them a wide variety of evergreen uh, plants because it was winter by then and the tree of heaven did not have any leaves anymore. And they fed on uh, basically every little leaf I gave them. And yes, they even fed on chili pepper leaves. And now the second generation of my Tree of Heaven silk moths 
has uh, pupated basically completely. Maybe one lava has not pupated yet, but all the others have. And it is time to process them. And as of this recording, I have already uh, processed uh, those, but uh, this video is already way, way longer than I uh, planned on doing it. So this will be uh, to be continued.